My name is Isabel Soto. I am the Director of Policy for the Libre Initiative. We are a grassroots Hispanic organization that focuses on freedom-minded solutions in healthcare, economic freedom, uh, immigration, and education. So we're focused on, on, on immigration as, as we talk about the border. And I was at the border the same time you were. Uh, yeah. Maybe not your first visit. It was my first visit uh, to, to McAllen, uh, Texas. And that, that visit, that, that whole trip was so much about the understanding that there is no one solution, uh, especially when you realize that the wall, which Border Patrol is not opposed to, the wall's not on the border. The wall mm -hmm. is is inland in places like McAllen, places on the Rio Grande, because of the winding nature uh, of of the river. How often do you run into uh, people thinking that there's just one way to solve this issue? Yeah, I think it's it's often it's all the time. It's either you know build the wall or it's fix legal immigration and that will fix everything, or just close off all ports of entry. We need to completely halt everything. And the the difficulty with this issue is that because it's so complex, but it's also such a hot button issue, is every single person has an opinion and a way that they think that this problem is gonna be solved. Is there anything that we ever start with where we're like, you know what, we do this, and this works pretty well, this is a good idea. Do we have any of those being implemented right now? Yeah, so I think the key word you're using there is implemented. Are there a bunch of different ideas? Absolutely. Are there a bunch of different ideas that, that could plausibly work and are frankly not that expensive? Yes. Are there things being implemented right now? There's nothing like if I can say today, here's one thing that they are doing on the border that's working. Other than the hard work that the that the Border Patrol agents have to do every single day, there's not one specific policy that I see that has been absolutely effective uh, by far and away. Is there anything that you would say is partially effective? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think trying to reduce um, individuals coming to the border uh, and kind of waiting there to get processed. There are these other centers that have uh, started to get open in other countries. That's a promising idea. So that, again, it, it remains to be seen that that's actually going to work, but it's something more or less bipartisan. So that is a, that's an exciting thing that's in the works. So when we talk about that, you mean things that, as we say in the vernacular, remain in Mexico, like those kinds of, of policies? It's a little less that it's a little bit more on the technical side. So when people come, they can use like the CBP one app is a good example of basically individuals that are planning to come and seek asylum. They can apply for asylum in another country and stay there while their application is being processed. Instead of what the status quo is, is people come, they cross and immediately claim asylum. And then so they that, wait in the U.S. That app was put forth by the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. People, by and large, didn't use it because it seems that what they would rather do is come to the border and take their chances or come to the border and see if they'll get caught at all. Right. And not to mention, I mean, there were immense technical problems with the app, right? And you're assuming that it's it's easy to be able to use it, it and that's just not the case. So it, it is responding to a number of different incentives. And what you've mentioned of, of people taking their chances, the reality is the, the individuals that try to cross the border, the only information that they reliably get is from bad actors. So the cartels who are profiting off of this whole broken system, those are the only people that are constantly in touch within what some ways they view as, as their customer base. And so it's really hard to be pushing against the messaging um, when the messaging is saying, go, 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 and cross the border. So they're customers, which is a whole, there's a coyote conversation. So that's to put it lightly. <laughs> right, right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I know, and it is, it is. Mm -hmm. I think we're, neither one of us is trying to downplay the horror that a lot of people go through yeah. in trying to get uh, to the country, which is a different conversation than whether or not they should be allowed in the country, which right. is a part of the policy problem that we see. Do, is, is it is it the United States giving a mixed message of, yeah, we're open, no, we're not? Or is it much more of the cartel-related side, as you've been able to study it, about uh, it, it doesn't matter what they say, we'll get you through, just give us the money, give us the money, give us the money? Yeah, well, it's both. I mean, if you have weak messaging from the United States government, that is perfect for the cartels to be able to exploit. Um, when you have an administration that is wishy-washy on the border, and for a very long time, which I think has, has changed slightly, but for a very long time, the Biden administration was saying, the border is secure and everything's fine. We don't need to worry about it. 
the cartels can say, yeah, see, everything's fine. They're not worried about it. They're not sending anyone to the border. They aren't increasing um, border patrol agents. Feel free to come by. There was a mixed messaging that occurred when Title 42 ended uh, from the cartel side that the border would be completely open for 48 hours. Again, just completely false. And the Biden administration was not doing a good job getting out in front of this and at least trying to dissuade people from coming. Talk to Isabel Soto. She is the policy director for the Libre uh, Initiative. They focus on economic uh, liberty, immigration issues. Uh, the, the Biden administration not getting ahead of things. I, I could and you could probably go on for a long time about mm -hmm. Biden administration issues and where the political differences lie. But this is both parties uh, failing uh, on the border. Uh, and the, the question is, what policies are they putting forth that don't seem to get either side to come together? Or is it both sides that don't actually put forward policies that provide any value at all? Part of it is that there's this there's this horrible and twisted incentive to put up these massive pieces of legislation. And this is both parties put up massive pieces of legislation, be it like border security on the right like huge and sticking stuff in there that we know does not have bipartisan consensus and will never get passed. But I could go home to my constituents and say, look, I'm trying to do things about the border. And then on the other side, we can have a massive bill uh, from the left, from the Democrats, that have a bunch of asylum things in there, a bunch of uh, legal immigration, and then pushing, pushing more to the point that it's not bipartisan and no one on the right will vote for it. But you can go back home to your district and say, I'm trying to get stuff done. But, you know, these Republicans or these Democrats won't let us get things done. So there's this weird situation where there's not a huge incentive to actually fix this problem. When you discuss with people uh, the problem, how do you describe it? In a word, complicated. So if we're talking about the border, I think the big distinction to make there is that, yes, it's a huge like uh, national security issue. It's also a humanitarian issue. So there are two avenues with which you discuss that. So it's it's extremely complicated. And what I don't want to do is pretend like only addressing the border is the way to move forward. We can't ignore the legal pathways and vice versa. Some individuals only want to focus on those legal pathways and think everything else will be fixed if you fix that process. But the reality is you have to do both at the same time. That is the best way to tackle this. When I talk to people about this and talk about the humanitarian issues. Uh, and I've said this before on radio. What about the humanitarian issues that the border causes right here in the United States? What about what it causes for those who live uh, on the border, live on, on those ranches? What does it cause for towns like El Paso? What does it cause for towns uh, li like McAllen that are dealing with this massive influx and simply can't handle it, never mind other things that, co that come with that, which is a crime problem? which is a, a dollars and cents problem. And there's also a, a, a you know, a, I, I don't want to say a disease problem, but an illness issue. There are things that other nations have that we haven't dealt with in a great long time because we have a better sanitation conversation. We have a better healthcare uh, uh, conversation. How do you redress the people who discuss, well, what about the humanitarian situation for the United States? Yeah, and it's, it's a humanitarian, well, it's well put. It's humanitarian, not just for the individuals coming in, but the people that already live there. Right. We're talking about we're talking about the, the border that's shared with Texas. What a lot of people a lot of people don't know is that that border, the majority of it is actually privately owned land, individuals, actual homes and businesses that migrants are crossing into. And then on top of that, we have the scarcity issue. Um, some of these small towns, they don't have the resources or they have just enough resources to be able to address the day to day. They're used to addressing, you know, the number of people that typically come to their hospital every year, the number of staff that they'll need. When you have a thousand people cross, uh, all of a sudden it becomes a group of people that likely don't need medical care pretty urgently. We don't want to necessarily, you know, diminish that, but resources are scarce and that's the reality. And ultimately it, it, it hurts not just the migrants, but like you said, it hurts the whole community because no one is getting what they need uh, and the resources are dwindling. And it, it's becoming harder and harder to be able to sustain that. So we have a, a problem in terms of the humanitarian on, on every side. Mm -hmm. We have a problem in terms of the economics. We have a problem in terms of policy. So when you say complicated, these are just some of the things that you are <laughs> referring to. Touch, yeah. Right. In, in the complicated issue. 
So when you're addressing this, whether it be members uh, on the Hill, Capitol Hill, or, or with people uh, across the country, what does Libre put forth as, all right, here, here's our top three policies. We think these three things have implemented, or one thing have implemented, would make things better and maybe define better. I think in terms of what can make things better, I think it's keep it simple. We need to stop going after these pie in the sky bills. So there are things that we support, um, like addressing certain geographic barriers. So there's uh, Carrizo Cane, which is an extremely big challenge at the border for Border Patrol agents to deal with. It's this giant plant. It gets in the way. It makes it harder for people to do their jobs. Easy. Deal with that. The other thing is- It's a, wait, it's, it's, it's a plant? It's a plant. Carrizo Cane. It's giant, and it gets in the way, and it keeps people from doing their job. So this, you're talking about basically bulldozing it over, ripping it out of, by the roots. Yep. Yep. And it's, it's why, can't, why can't we do this? Because there isn't a standalone bill. This is something that a lot of uh, people on the right and left agree with. This is huge. It's a problem. But what we're doing it doing is packaging that tiny little fix into massive hundreds and hundreds of pages of legislation. And you can imagine if you have, you know, even 200 pages of legislation and one of those pages is about this, this plant, there are going to be other things in there that no one's going to like or only one party's going to like. So I think so keep we, it simple. So is, is standalone it. bills, and we start with just moving this plant out of the way, and that is going to help Border Patrol e more easily access people who are crossing. Yes. So I think it's it's that's okay. not you know the end-all, be-all, but that is one example. There are so many things. Improving technology at ports of entry, improving technology along the border in general. So cameras, for example. There's so many outdated pieces of tech that we don't even have parts for anymore to be able to replace an update. Um, Border Patrol is now using drones, ensuring that they have all the capabilities that they need to be able to monitor. And, and by the way, it's not just Border Patrol, the cartels are making use of drones. Um, so we need to be able to not just like keep up with the cartel, but you know, be four, five, six steps ahead of them. So that's that's one of the main things is making sure that we have an actual border that can anticipate and not just react. Talking to Isabel Soto, she is the policy director for the Libre uh, Initiative. Do you find that there are people, uh, representatives, senators, however, you know, and members of, of the political sphere, mm -hmm. who, who have no interest in fixing the border because the issue is of more value than the fix? Unfortunately, I think, yeah, that's that's true. It's it's easier to talk about a broken border than have a situation where you have a fixed one and the process works. You get much more political capital from pointing at your opponents and telling them that what they've done is, you know, this horrible thing to the country and they aren't acting on it. That's a huge bargaining chip. It's a huge thing, especially in an election. How, how, do you does does Libre address that with 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 members of Congress? Does it? Does it bring this up at all, or or is that kind of out of their out of their sphere? Oh, we we talk to whoever we need to talk to to get things done. So we will work with anyone who has a good idea. Uh, to to that end, uh, you brought up in the beginning uh, that you're a. I think the term you used were you're a Hispanic organization. Mm -hmm. um, so it would lead one to wonder whether you your your advocacy is for something political, or is your advocacy geared towards people who are Hispanic and saying that this this is not something that is uh, you, you you could be silent on. This is something you have to be proactive on mm -hmm. to to the betterment of of the American society. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 what we think is, you know, we need the Hispanic voice to to be present in the political discussions. I mean, at this point, we're about 18 percent of the country and we're only projected to grow. Uh, for example, over the next, I think it's 10, 20 years, about uh, Hispanics are projected to be 70% of the workforce. We need to be empowered to be able to engage in our political system. So Libre is, is not just talking to Hispanics. But we are a Hispanic-led organization. We're coming out of places like McAllen. Um, we're coming from all over the country. And so we are trying to put together a voice for individuals that, that kind of are in the same space as us and are, are fed up with things not moving. So let me get political for for a moment because mm -hmm. why not? Um, yeah. You, if if you were to poll a, a any subset of, of Americans, 
they would tell you that people are trying to get into the country from Central America, from South America, are people that the Democratic Party wants to bring in to, th- to make them voters. Mm-hmm. Is, is it your, uh, through your analysis, through your study, through your talking to people, having visited the border, work with Libre, uh, is it your feeling that that's what you would get? People coming who want to come to America who immediately would vote uh, with the Democratic Party? Yeah, I, I've heard this one a lot. Um, and I think it's a really common misconception. It's really simplifying the issue, in part because if we're seeing shifts in the Hispanic electorate, the shift that's happening is not moving further and further left. People are shifting right. And part of it is because of the poor decisions that are being made. And in part of the, if we're talking political, the Democratic Party is taking Hispanic voters for granted. And the Republican Party is offering a way forward to make fixes to things that Hispanics care about. And frankly, immigration is not in the top three. The things in the top three are uh, inflation, general economic welfare, uh, healthcare, and education. And these are things that Republicans are pushing on, things like uh, educational freedom, more options, school choice. If you look at who cares the most about that particular issue, break it down by race, ethnicity, it's Hispanics, about 77%. So there are all these other things we need to take into account. Um, when we talk about people, you know, coming into the country, I don't think it's it's not a smart political play if it is one at all, um, is to let people in that in from a demographic that is actually shifting right. That is Isabel Soto, policy director with the Libre uh, Initiative. Isabel, thank you. Thank you.